Yeah, today's video is a back to basics topic that's a question that's asked quite often is why we have to put diodes around relay coils also called snubber diodes or flyback diodes. But before we discuss that there's uh, two basic concepts we have to understand and remember. One is that a current flow through a wire induces a magnetic field around that wire and we all remember this from uh, building uh, electromagnets with a nail and a dry cell battery and a coil of wire in elementary school. Um, and it's the fundamental principle behind everything from loudspeakers to electric motors to essentially the way the solenoid effectively works inside of a relay. But the opposite is true as well. Uh, when the, the magnetic field around a wire changes, it induces a current flow. So let's illustrate that over here. Now to illustrate this concept, uh, I've got a coil of wire, nothing more than an inductor, clipped into my scope probe going into the scope here. I've got a magnet on the back of this uh, flashlight here and you'll notice as I pass the inductor across the magnet I can induce essentially a voltage change that we see on the scope screen. So what's happening is the changing magnetic field is inducing a current in the coil. That current is then impressing a voltage across the input impedance of the scope probe. So we can see how a changing magnetic field can induce a current and cause a voltage to appear in a circuit. So of course the same principle applies when we're talking about relays and switching them on or off. When you're turning off a relay coil, the drop in current causes a collapsing of the magnetic field. Uh, even though we're, we're not mechanically inducing it, we're electrically inducing this change in magnetic field. That collapse in the magnetic field induces a current in the same original direction that the current was originally flowing when the coil was on. And of course, if no diode was present, this current can generate a very high voltage at the switch. So let's go take a look at a schematic and actually make some measurements and see what happens. So this is the schematic of the test circuit that we'll be using to take a look at the effect of this flyback diode. So I've got a simple uh, low power relay here. And I've got that uh, turning on or off an LED so we can actually see you know, the relay operate. Uh, the relay is going to be activated by this transistor here, which is being fed by a pulse generator that I can manually trigger just to give me a simple 5 volt pulse to turn it on and turn it off. And of course we're really interested in what happens when this turns off, because that's when the problems can arise. So I'm probing a number of different things on the scope. We'll take first and foremost a look at uh, channel 1, which is the collector voltage here because this is the place where there will be trouble. If we don't have this diode, this voltage can reach very high levels. We'll talk about why. We're also probing the current that's going into the relay coil here with a current probe. We're also probing the emitter here, and this is going to be proportional to the emitter current. And when the diode isn't there, those two currents are basically going to be the same. And then, of course, we're probing the, uh, the input voltage, so we'll use that as a trigger. All right, so here's our circuit down on the circuit board. Let's take a look at what we've got. So this is the relay that we're taking a look at here. This is the LED that will light up. This is the current probe that's in series with the power supply and one side of the coil for the relay. This is the transistor that's doing the switching. This is the 20 ohm emitter resistor here. So this is the uh, collector probe, the emitter probe, the input probe, and of course the current probe. Now you may have noticed when I was uh, pointing out everything on the circuit here that uh, I didn't point out the diode. So we're going to make our first measurements without the diode here to show you some of the bad things that can happen. I'm using this MPSA42 transistor here uh, for a reason. This is a relatively high voltage uh, switching transistor. Uh, its collector emitter breakdown voltage is on the order of 300 volts. So let's go take a look at what happens uh, on the circuit here. Uh, without that diode present. So let's reach over and uh, trigger the uh, pulse generator and capture some waveforms on the scope. So let's take a look at these waveforms. Uh, right here, this is our input pulse. So channel 3, it's on a 5 volt per division scale. That's turning off the transistor right here. Okay, and that's what we triggered on. This uh, green trace, channel 4, is the emitter current. It's essentially the voltage across that 20 ohm emitter resistor, but it's directly proportional to the emitter current. The, this trace up here, channel 2, is the current through the relay coil. And of course these two things are going to mirror each other 
and of course they're on different scales but uh, but you can see they basically follow each other uh, channel 1 is the voltage at the collector now one thing to be note to note here is look at the voltage scale this is 100 volts per division so when we turned off this little 5 volt pulse we've got 5 volts on the other side of the relay coil but when we did that without that protection diode the voltage on the collector rose 100, 200, a little over 250 volts peak uh, before the uh, essentially the coil ran out of magnetic energy. The, the current collapsed all the way down, and the, the voltage then started to fall. But still is sitting you know, near 100 volts and still tailing out here over the rest of the trace. So we can see you know, quite easily without that flyback diode that some pretty lethal voltages in terms of. Uh, being dangerous to electronic circuits can occur without uh, putting that protection in place. Let's, let's take a look at why that happens and how such a high voltage got generated here at the collector when this diode was not present. Uh, when the pulse generator shuts off, uh, this transistor which was in hard saturation is going to turn off, but of course there's a little bit of saturation delay that's very common with uh, bipolar transistor so you know, a couple of microseconds later this transistor starts to shut off. As it starts to shut off the current starts reducing in this collector leg therefore reducing in the uh, coil. That reduction in current causes a collapse of the uh, magnetic field in that coil which causes a current to be pushed out of that coil but since this transistor is off that looks like a high impedance. So this voltage is being pushed, or excuse me, the current that's being pushed out here generates a, a rising voltage on this node. So this voltage rises up, it goes you know, certainly past 5 volts, it keeps going because this current still has to go somewhere and it's just basically creating a larger and larger and larger voltage at this point until that you know, field completely collapses and then things can settle out. So we can see because this is such a high impedance when it's turned off that very large voltage can be uh, generated and it can certainly damage a transistor and, uh, and certainly even any circuitry that might be driving a relay coil directly. So let's take a look at what happens if we put in a different transistor here, a more common transistor, something like a 2N3904. Right, so here's a very common uh, 2N3904, 2N2222, kind of be about the same thing. We'll yank out the MPSA42 and stick the uh, 2N3904 in its place. And let me go uh, reactivate the trigger and collect that waveform. So now we see something interesting here. Uh, when the transistor is turned off, we can see the collector voltage rise uh, very quickly afterwards, but reaches about, in this case, about 60 to 70 volts. Remember, we're still in that 100 volt per division scale. So we reach about 60 or 70 volts and then it flattens out and what that tells me is that that transistor has gone into collector, uh, excuse me, collector emitter breakdown. So, uh, so that's uh, kind of broken down, it's almost like a Zener diode, like an avalanche breakdown. So now the current you know, going through the coil and now down through the emitter is now decaying as that field collapses around the coil until we get to the point where the field is completely collapsed, the voltage rises a little bit because it's the avalanche current is being turned down and then once that essentially turns off we still have this uh, current that uh, or this charge that essentially has got to completely bleed out. So we can see that unlike the high voltage transistor we've actually reached a breakdown point with this transistor. Uh, did we kill it or damage it? Probably not but uh, you wouldn't want to do this repetitively because this kind of breakdown can uh, ultimately damage these transistors. Right, so let's switch back to the high voltage transistor. Uh, stick that back in place here. And we'll also stick the protection diode in now. So there's the uh, transistor back in place. We'll re-trigger the scope to make sure we get the same response. That's all still working the same. Now let's put the protection diode in from the collector to the 5 volt supply. So now if I trigger the scope again, take a look at the waveform. Well, so a, lot, a lot of different things going on here, but first off, we don't see that huge voltage spike on the collector anymore. So let's uh, reduce the scale down on, uh, on channel 1 to 5 volts of division and collect this waveform again. So we can see now when the, we turn the transistor off, that voltage just starts rising up. And remember, this is now at 5 volts of division with ground being here at the center radical.
So this first radical is 5 volts. So we can actually see the voltage is going up a little bit above 5 volts. If I put a cursor on that and uh, just kind of walk that way up here, we can see it goes to about 5.8, uh, 5.879 volts. So what that's telling me is that voltage is being driven up above the positive supply and then turning on the diode, and that's why it goes flat. But you'll also notice something else interesting here. The emitter current, essentially, when that happens, goes down and basically goes to ze near zero. So uh, that tells me that the transistor basically has stopped conducting, it's not taking any more current, but there's still a fair amount of current flowing in that coil because that current is now flowing you know, through the coil and around uh, the diode back to the positive supply. And we can see it's, it hasn't really uh, died out yet. So let's slow the sweep speed way down here. Let's go down to about a millisecond of division and re-trigger it again. And we, now we can actually see that you know, the emitter current you know, nearly shuts off. The uh, current through the coil and, and therefore through the coil and the diode basically decays down a little bit of a, a ring here, you know, could likely be due to the fact that we've got an inductor and capacitance on the power supply and things like that. But ultimately, when it finally dies out, is when the when the voltage at the collector drops back down here to about five volts, and everything is kind of static at that point. But it took several milliseconds. So the effect of the diode when we put it in the circuit is to basically take all of that energy that's stored in the magnetic field for the uh, relay coil and basically spread it out over time and dissipate it safely into the positive supply. Another question that often comes up is what kind of diode should we be using for that switch for the uh, uh, snubber or flyback diode? And the answer is it, it isn't that terribly important. Uh, I just threw an ordinary switching diode in here when we just did this measurement. But uh, you know, even simple things like 1 in 914s or 4148s uh, will work just fine. Uh, certainly even rectifier diodes like 1 in you know, 4000 series rectifiers will work fine as well. I tend to use the switching diodes because they, they switch a lot faster. They don't store a lot of charge internally in their junctions. Uh, you don't really have to worry too much about uh, the breakdown voltage of the diode because the diode basically prevents the high voltage from ever occurring here. It never gets exposed to that very high voltage. It simply just bleeds the current away, provides another path for that current to go you know, as this field collapses around the coil. So you just have to kind of ensure that the diode is rated for essentially the coil current. Because if we take a look at uh, the current here, it never really goes, it never peaks up. So the uh, diode is basically just seeing, you know, the, the main coil current under normal operating conditions and then dissipating and going down from there. So you don't have to have a high power diode here. You just want something that's got reasonably good switching characteristics. So to prove the point, I'll take the, uh, the switching diode out that I had in here. I'll clear the waveforms and then drop in a, uh, there's a 1N4004. Uh, higher power rectifier diode. I'll stick that in place here and uh, re-trigger this uh, waveform. And we can see the waveform is basically the same. So there's really no, ch no difference in using uh, a simple little glass uh, switching diode like this one here or a high power rectifier. So um, anyway, I hope uh, you enjoyed the video, learned a little bit about why uh, we use these snubber or flyback diodes around uh, inductive loads. Relay coils are one of them. Um, you know, little permanent magnet motors and things like that are certainly other areas where that type of protection might be warranted. Thanks again for watching and comments are always welcome.